for the meeting of the CCS. I want to first of all make a more recent announcement of this block meeting by the chairs. Um, it's been the uh, habit of the society from time to time to not to have uh, subscriptions, but to appeal for donations to help support our work. And we felt it was time we should do this again. And uh, that's what this, this piece of paper is all about. Um, but there will be another copy of this form in the next resurrection, which is going out soon. Soon. Soon, as I said. So, well, it's my great pleasure to introduce Charlie Packham, um, who is, in a sense, doesn't need introduction, but like the person I've met him. Um, and what Charlie is well known for, of course, is database work. He developed the IDS integrated data store on the first data management systems, and he's worked um, on IDMS uh, and had his own company for the time. Uh, more distinguished, he received the ACM Turing Award in 1973 for his outstanding contribution to database technology, and was elected a distinguished fellow of the British Review Society in 1977. In fact, it's our second long-standing distinguished fellow. I can still say it. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a big gap between him and Morris Wilkes, practically. <laughs> <laughs> the rest have died. Um, and I think we're very proud of him, Charlie, as a distinguished fellow of the CS. He's listed in the Hall of Fame. Uh, his distinguished fellowship, he was awarded 31 years ago. So, it's not so very well. Charlie, it's all yours. Thank you. I'm going to stand over here most of the time. Uh, you know, we have a very small group. Anyone in the back would like to move forward and be closer part of the party or not hide behind this post if you want to move in a little bit. And I'm going to be over here. You're going to disappear. Sorry. I don't want you to disappear, please. I can hear you. Oh, yes. I'm going to smile. You have to see that, too. All right. Let's see. It's a pleasure to come and join this group today. and. Normally, when I make a presentation, I try to get through it and say there's time for questions. I think the group is small. We really have the privilege to let you interject a question whenever you want. I'm comfortable with that. So if I say something that you don't understand, or that you challenge because you don't think it's right, because that's all a possibility. Many of these things are from my memory. My memory is not perfect. But it seems I remember some things in great detail. And the thing to be the things I thought most important, so that's what we're going to talk about the integrated data store today. And much about that story is still very vivid in my mind, at, at the gruesome level of detail even. So that, uh, next slide please. So this presentation was first presented to the Computer History Museum in the United States in California. And the people talk about, did, Charlie, did you invent the integrated data store. And inventing seems like something different than assembling a bunch of parts that are well known, but in fact, they, the combination is unique. So th I thought assembling the integrated data store was a better description of the process than inventing it. In fact, it may be more difficult, I'm not sure, because I didn't invent it, so I can't compare. Now, just to kind of set the context, although some of you may be old enough to remember some of these things. As uh, so the calendar, if we go back to the 1940s, there were no computers to be seen, really. Although I got my first computer in the Army, Army Anti Aircraft Fire Control computer in 1943, so I guess there were computers, but they were analog, special purpose computers. They were not general purpose computers as we know them today. In the 50s, we had the early Univac and computer machines, 701s, Univac 1s, 702s, 704s. And people get, get, get things started. And in fact, that was the period where I first tipped my toe into computer world and tried to put together a what we call an IT group today for Dow Chemical Company. And as part of that, I got a chance to join the SHARE organization, which was a group of IBM customers of 701s and 704s. And they're really very bright guys. And they were really educated, like going to graduate school with those people. In 1960s, the first database management system. In the 70s, the graphic display monitors came on, microcomputers came, internet 
I'm not sure what we do in the 2000s, maybe because I just don't know what happened in the 2000s. But a lot of different internet applications appeared, and people talk about cloud computing and strange things like that, which sounds like time sharing to me. A new name. In fact, people tell me that they have nothing new, we just have new packaging of it. Or they run 10 times faster and it seems different. Or maybe I should say 1,000 times faster. Uh, just again to set the reference here, the 1960 computer really was the architecture set up in the late 50s for computers, but they were, you know, excuse me, I want to slide off my cow. Did we miss a slide, John? Excuse me. No. I turned the page too soon. Uh, but someone talked in those days about Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. You know, there were IBM, which was big and profitable and got away with all kinds of murder. Then the rest of us, you know, the General Electrics, the Honeywells, the Burroughs, the RCAs. I'm talking about really U.S. firms. Those are the ones that are visible to me primarily. Univac control data, NCR. And the IBM machines really, and all their development work, was well funded because IBM was selling punch card equipment in a very profitable way. And it really paved the way for them to stay very profitable, at the same time develop their computer things, although I sometimes think they weren't very clever with their money on what they achieved. The rest of the seven doors were losing money or breaking even at best. And their corporate sponsors were really the venture capitalists of the day. You know, it was GE, corporate headquarters that was funding the GE computer business. And the, and the computers were selling roughly one to seven million dollars at price range. And of course, you could load it up with two drives and the tape drives and other things, and it could be much more than that. But they were, you know, they don't compare with my computer, my cell phone, in you know, terms of speed, or my laptop, which has got, I don't know, 50 gigabytes of storage. Uh, early when we had, we did 10 megabytes of storage. Real difference. Next one, please. Now, the computer. Architecture in the 1950s, in fact, sometimes computer architecture doesn't change very fast. It is electron tubes with limited core memory, and people used to wire those core memories by hand. They had magnetic tapes, early, the earliest mass storage devices, and they were not used very well, and most, mostly used for storing programs, not much used for data. As line printers, card punches, input, inner programming execution, one card loader. In fact, the first time I got a real hands on a computer at GE, you got a one card. And that card you put in the card reader and said push the start button. It would read that one card into a fixed location and transfer control to where that card landed. And then it, in, in that card would execute until, you now if you did enough of that card to get everything else loaded in, then you could load your whole program and go. But it was a one card loader. And if that was the first operating system, okay, but it's not much of an operating system. So they did have unit programming execution, the one card loaders, assemblers, some business language things. So people had predecessors to COBOL. In fact, from Honeywell, they had Comtran from IBM, they had GCOM from General Electric. All these were early business oriented programming languages, very similar in many ways. Uh, but there were no operating systems really, no file systems, no database systems, no communication systems and no application packages. You really had a naked machine in some sense to play with. Now, the next, the next slide, please. General Electric at that time, and this is speaking for the summer of 1960 from my perspective, they had 100 different product departments, each one making something from light bulbs to nuclear power plants to computers to electronics, switching for switch gears, a whole range of products all in the somehow electrically aligned. And switches to turn lights on and off your house were part of what they had. And they were, as it turned out, every one of these departments was trying to build themselves their own manufacturing control system. So they could look at it and solve their personal problem. And this was costing GE a bundle of money, and the results basically were disappointing. People didn't like the fact that the money was going for it, and the systems themselves were not really very good. So a study team was recruited, and we interpreted our assignment to design and build a generic 
production control system. So that's where this IDS project started from, an attempt to build a generic manufacturing control <laughs> system. And we backed into the database thing. And we designed the, the manufacturing control system <coughs> and how do you program that. And from there, the story comes from there. So let's skip ahead. Now at that time, in fact, that's a slide I made last night. And my wife said, well, people are involved. You've got to give people credit. But really, the, the, the General Electric authorized the second integrated system project. The leader was Stan Williams with 12 years of engineering experience in GE. No programming experience. The architect was Charlie Bachman. That's me. 10 years of engineering, finance, production, and data systems experience at Dow Chemical Company. No programming experience. Homer Carney, six years experience in General Electric. So he was programmed for six years, so he's our expert programmer. And there's uh, other part-time advisors. I had that thing the last moment today. Well, the people who claimed they were part of the project, and I said, put them down here somehow. But I said they were part-time advisors. They were not doers. And there's a real difference between a doer and an advisor. Now, one of the first things we had to do is that we have to look at a real GE department. And if we can't find a real GE department, it'll let us look, come and look. And that can be embarrassing, too. Come look and study their problem and see what they have. Then we had to build a generic system that won't solve at least one department's problem. We haven't done anything at all. So we had one look for a department who could be our prototype. And we picked, in fact, we didn't take, we were picked by GE's high voltage switchgear department, who manufactured large, huge circuit breakers that were in the high voltage lines. And the ability to quench the arc when you break the circuit, because they had a big voltage surge across it, and actually try to quench it in a big tub of oil down below. And then it turns out we did a very nice job of preparing, this is what we want to do, and they said, well, you know, we don't really want to do that. So it turns out another GE department, low voltage switchgear, happened to be at the same location, said, We'll gamble. And you have to understand, this is a gambling situation. And G at that time in his management's philosophy said, if you're the general manager of a department, it's your job to make a profit. And it's not your job to do anything marvelous for the world. You're supposed to make a profit. In fact, the general manager of High World Switcher said, well, if I can do that project, but it won't help me make my money, my numbers for next year. And so it sounds all like you're nice and good and all those things, but I'm not for it. It turns out we found a more adventurous general manager at low voltage switch here, and we went on from there. And both of these were in the GE power generation and distribution products business. And both were located in Philadelphia, so actually they were in the same six-story old-style manufacturing building. So we just didn't do, we still kept our office across the street. We got a new set of people from low voltage switch gear from their manufacturing systems people, a couple more new people from their engineering department, and went forward with that. Now the application problem, really, we looked at, in fact, this is speaking of high voltage switch work first. They had an existing computer-based production control system, which created a manufacturing plan for each order that came in. That's good. When the order fit, created when the order was received, and then ignored it during the subject execution. That's a critical thing. They ignored that plan. And here it is. We've done our job. Thank you. But passed it over to production people. The manufacturing resource utilization was neither planned nor monitored. So they didn't know whether they had enough machine tools of a particular type or enough paint booths to paint something or assembly areas to assemble things and to make the orders that all plan work. So it was really a strange thing. So the management process was scheduled but not monitored, nor were the results fed back to the computer system for reevaluation and planning. The system was really considered to be broken. Now, given we have extra time today in this whole audience, this happened to correlate somewhat with an experience I had during World War II when I was involved with anti-aircraft fire control equipment and spent a great deal of time in New Guinea. Lovely place. Well, better than being in northern Europe during the winter. New Guinea in the winter was not bad at all. It just rained a little more. But anyway, we had 90 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. There were the high level guns at that time. Shot a 90 meter diameter shell so long. And that's not very big to hit anything. It's up in the air, two or three miles up there. So we had a fire control director, which was a 
the first computer I played with. And it essentially was a box about a meter on the side and had aluminum bars you could play with that. And four strong men could get this thing off the ground and lift it in the back of a six by six truck. That was a, you couldn't get in the truck, you couldn't take it with you. So it was portable if you were strong enough. Anyway, as we observed this thing in operation, we could see that we could use this thing and we could turn the cranks and we could track, we practiced shoot, shooting at big long cloth socks tra trailed behind airplanes. And we were very good at hitting those socks. We could make holes in them all the time. And I couldn't figure out why we couldn't hit the Japanese Betty bombers that were flying over in the same pattern. Well, not the same pattern because they didn't fly straight. And so all of a sudden the thought came to my mind that what we have is a system in our any aircraft gun that looked at with airplanes and you're here, and I threw my analog device, I can tell you're here, and I, hear, I can project a straight line through the sky on this mechanical computer, and so then I should aim the gun there, and it goes up and hits and blows. And that should be work perfectly if the Japanese airplanes were flying straight. But they were smarter than our designers were, and they didn't fly straight. So then they would kind of come in and they would dart around the sky until they found something they were going to drop a bomb on. And then we never hit them. We made a lot of noise, though. The guns were very noisy. Then it came to my mind that they weren't hitting anything, anything either. Because their bomb sites must assume they're going to fly straight also. And that it was smarter to just not fly straight than it was to fly straight. So they didn't hit anything. And they made a lot of noise. But the point comes back to if you, you need feedback in a system, so that if you need to correct your aim, in fact, not too many years later, the US Air Force came up with their sidewinder missile, which is not very smart at all. It just says, I can see you. I'm going to fly where you are. Oops, you moved. I can see you. I'm going to fly where you are. And so it continually fed back. And a very simple algorithm, it says, I can see you, I can see you, I can see you. Boom. And they were deadly machines because they kept correcting their course. And the manufacturing control system at high voltage switchgear did not correct its course. And we all know that in factories that one a new order coming in can affect what would be, be an optimum plan, what you're going to do. Or feedback, you could order some spare parts and they came in with 50 parts instead of 100. Well, what are you going to do? You scramble to change some plans to make it work again. So that the manufacturing systems are not, don't fly straight. And the art of being successful is being able to do something so you can keep correcting your plans so they're always feasible and you come pretty close to being where you want to be. And if you keep most of your customers happy, that's, that's the end, end game. Let's go to the next one, please. In fact, I'm doing a poor job trying, trying to use my slides here. Now, the solution to this thing is to Construct a manufacturing information and control system based on PERT or CPM, a network program. PERT is um, oh, CPM critical path method. PERT is a Navy system. Program evaluation and review team. Thank you. But essentially, they've dealt with projects that have to be done and precedence relations. I must finish this one before I can start that one. And it went the same way in the factory, because the factory is not just one PERT system, or one CPM system for a big manufacturing plant or a big power plant. In fact, my experience with the CPM was, in fact, doing that for a manufacturing plant, excuse me, a power plant the Dow Chemical is building. And that one of the things that CPM will do, it'll calculate the critical path through these various activities to get how long it should take you to get to the final result. At that time, it struck me that, you know, when I went to the engineering department and asked, well, how long does it take to do this job, this job? And I would like, like, I'm scratch their head and they give me an answer. I said, That's, you know, what if that isn't a good answer? What, what if they don't know that, what the right time to estimate is? I said, well, let, let, tell me what you think is the most probable time. You know, with, uh, what is the fastest it might happen? What's the slowest it might happen? So I get three points on a curve. With the idea that if they did give me that for each of these steps, I could use a set of random numbers and generate something across the distribution of those three points. And so I ran 100 cases. So I had for each step in the process an estimate based on a random number generation of how long it could take. And so I, then I put these all back together. So I had a series of critical paths through the project, each with a different degree of probability. 
And so we could tell more about what's going on. Well, is this preamble, like if I ever wrote a program, I was one that created and generated random numbers. Now, I didn't invent that. I just got a software package to generate random numbers. And I think I actually ran it through BASIC. No, before BASIC. But anyway, whatever it was, there's a 600 program, 650 program to generate. So it used this C program. So what we want to do, in fact, is to be able to create networks of orders and requirements for raw materials, and requirements for resources, and that we could hook all together. So it wasn't one, pro one big power plant we're designing. It's a continuing manufacturing plan that every day is going to be updated with more tasks to be done, more orders to be handled, and then they need to work this thing over again. So in the end, we said, let's create a new feasible plan for tomorrow. Now, the word feasible I emphasize here because at that time, General Electric had a corporate group in New York City who were experts in operational planning, operational or operation research. And they had some very strong ideas about the right thing to do. And OR came out of World War II. And these people, we went to, and we were trying to sell ourselves to the various GE organizations. And they said, well, I talked about our feasible plan. They said, well, you should be calculating an optimum plan. And my response was, you ought to be satisfied to have a feasible plan. And even if it was optimum at one moment, in a minute or an hour or two hours, it would no longer be optimum. It would, things have changed. So let's, let's not kill ourselves trying to be optimal. Let's just be, have a feasible plan. Because, because then we, if we have a feasible plan at midnight, we can cut out factory paper to go to the shop, tell them what to do today based on all your resource requirements are available and all your material requirements are available. So we'll do the next step in the process. And we'll get feedback. And then tomorrow we'll have some more things that are feasible to do. Next one, please. Now, this diagram, this, the diagram itself is a little bit new, but this represents the critical awakeness in our ideas of what we're doing. Because this, in effect, the bill of materials processing is the heart of the manufacturing problem, or maybe the heart of the engineering problem. To make something that's made out of, calls out some other material items, which are called out some other. So in fact, I can start with, let's say, an automobile. An automobile has four, four wheels, and has one engine, and then we well, look at the engine. The engine's got eight pistons or four pistons, whatever it is, and each piston may be a different type. So that it's a integrated structure, and people who are doing parts explosion using magnetic tape systems did a lot of processing, and they saved the result because they couldn't regenerate easily. So I said, well, again, if this is nothing but a network system, and if we can build this in, and then we, when we get an item to do, we said, no, okay, this item requires some things. This type, and, so, and that, this, in effect, is the heart of the, what we call the network data model. And so it's where we started from. You get the, because it was clearly a network. And we look further down the way, I'll show you some more complex data structure diagrams. They're full of these relationships that link things together, and just they're not susceptible to be processed in a serial way. So let's go to the next one, please. Now, the engineering challenge was to build the, the take the voluminous and interconnected network data structures required to record the manufacturing plans and their use of materials and resources, and to access such structures during the ongoing replanning and rescheduling cycle, required new hardware and software. And the, so the equipment we needed for hardware and software just wasn't available. The new GE 200 series computers was in the market, so I had a starting point. The new GE 204 disk storage devices were coming. They weren't there yet when we started this planning. So there's what somebody's responsible to get them there. We assume they're there and they assume they work. That's an interesting assumption we go back and talk about later. <laughs> Not all of them worked. Uh, then we said we needed a generic manufacturing control system was needed. That's our target. We needed an online transaction processing operating system, OLTP, was needed. They handle this thing. And finally a network database management system was needed. So a lot of work. And so our job, in effect, was to fulfill these last three steps, leaving General Electric the problem of handling things above it. Now, this manufacturing system acquired the name of MIAX, M-I-A-C-I-S, for Manufacturing Information and Control System. In fact, it really had three names. 
we work for materials service at General Electric. So it's, first of all, it's called a materials information and control system. Now, when we got above that level of management, we talked about the manufacturing. We talked to the vice president of manufacturing chief. It was a manufacturing information control system. And we got up to the higher level and said it's a management information control system. It was all worked. But no, it was an ambitious thing to do. And that my ex supported the daily operation of GE's low voltage switchgear and also the insulate department from 1965 until sometime I can have, but they switched to different computers and they were still running and they were happy with it. So it was a success. It also provided the foundation for GE's packaged manufacturing control system called GPEX. So I'm not going to spend any much more time talking about my ex, but that is the place we started from in this program. Now, the next problem was what do we do for an operating system? And you know, there were things, General Motors had done some work in it for their scientific calculations so they didn't have to go back to Carter. They could put a whole bunch of jobs in there on tape and read them in one after the other and do model programming a solution of one engineering problem and the next and the next. But they're really much, so in this case we had this, had all these programs for these different transactions that came in not contingent, but at most any time they would want it to be available over a 24 hour cycle. You know, feedback from the factory came back typically sometime in the evening. New orders came in all day and we kept feeding those into the computer. Shipments arrived, from new parts were buying our raw materials, we'd feed that information in when we could. So it was a continual feed of transactions that had to be handled in a relationship and dealt with a priority because some problems you have to sign and solve before you do some other ones. And there's questions relationship between them that you're dealing with. And we wanted to build an operator-less system that required human support only to feed new transaction cards into card reader. And we had to carry away punch cards for new transactions because the punch cards were the vehicle were giving people instructions to do things and reports as they might can. So that was the nature of what the system was trying to do. And to handle this thing, the solution was on the workload of my ex consisted of this large number of transactions of many transaction types. So we think about the transaction load. We have roughly 100 different transaction types, each with an application program, which is called when that transaction that type was to be processed. These are processed one transaction, at a one transaction at a time according to the priority for the transaction type, but also according to the first in, first out priority within the transaction type. So an early transaction for a new order and had a later arriving one. And each transaction type has its own program. The problem control, problem controller managed the application, processed a single transaction, and then stopped. Now the next transaction might be the same kind, and we would keep the same program in the computer. But the transaction didn't have to be programmed to, handle one, two, or three more transactions. Handle one and done. One transaction, whatever the required to be done. <coughs> and the new transaction that's associated could come from outside the world, but also some things we've had situations where the a transaction processing itself would generate new transactions. Like the parts explosion very clear if I would have a transaction to do this motor car and it has a transaction to build a motor. And that's, that's going to be a new transaction handled in the scheduling of motor manufacturing. We want to see whether you have motors in inventory for that purpose. And motors may call for pistons. So at each level of the explosion, you generate new transactions based on the... Uh, it's, it's, it's loaded as a parts explosion name that's suggested. And the problem controller is the name we gave to the this online transaction processing system. There was a problem controller because in those days GE advertised itself as problem solvers. So the GE computer department are problem solvers, then we had a problem controller. We talked about the transaction coming in with problems, and then they had problem data that came in with them. Now, there were two problem controllers. The first one we had jobbed out to the aerospace and division of General Motor, General Electric, excuse me. And they wrote a, a transaction processor they were going to use. It came back to us after a year, which we weren't paying much attention to what they were doing. And it was a 2,000 instructions long. Now, 
we had our, our biggest possible configuration was 8,000 instructions. It should have been eight or 16, the two choices. And 2,000 for the operating system just was unacceptable. So we ended up, we wrote it ourselves as another IDS application program, as one that stayed resident in memory. And that essentially it would take a transaction and store the transaction in the IDS database and store the tra transaction data records in the database. And so all the information that needed was available to be ha handled in the same navigational sense that IDS used for the actual production application. And people said, that's going to be too slow to have an operating system that runs interpretively. I said, well, you know, if it's too, uh, too IDS is too slow for this, it's going to be too slow for the manufacturing control system. So we're, we're planning on this manufacturing control system being running fast enough to run the business. And the amount of time we take to select the next transaction will not be a material part of the problem at that time. So we went ahead from there. And that, so the problem controller handled the transaction selection and managed the pool of working storage, excuse me, virtual memory. But the upper half of the machine that didn't have the IDS in it was available either for application program or virtual memory paging buffers. And that boundary moved up and down depending on how big the application program was. If you have a little application program, they have many more buffers. If you have a great big program, not many buffers. It would run slower because you couldn't build a working set in it. And so it, then it loaded the application program and tra transferred control of the application program and off it went. And then we transferred control back when it was finished. Now the database problem was this. So let me remember back in 1961, that was before the term database was invented. People were arguing whether the word is database or data space days. Was it one word or two words? That's how far we've gotten. In fact, I think if you read some of the literature, that hasn't been solved yet. There's still people who write in newspapers about databases as two words. And I keep saying it's not data, it's not database either, it's database. My wife told me that. Well, I'm not sure how they pronounce it. I think like, how do we say data or data over here? Data, good. And we had to devise an integrated data information language, an integrated description language that could get into existing application programs. Because one of the problems we have is how do we teach programmers how to do this new thing we want them to do? And how, how little can we get away with teaching them? Now, people were comfortable using programs like GCOM, in fact, and Contran, which were the prototype for Cortisol, Sonic, and Cobalt. And they were basically a record at a time mode programs. You get a record, you do something with it, and you get the next record. And so we need to build something that is consistent with how people think about their problem in 1960. Because that was our solution space. And so we said, well, we'll create a language that fits in, and we can drop these data validation statements in a program that does everything else in a normal way. And people did find that a comfortable way to work. Uh, the database solution is we created this thing called the Integrated Data Store. An invention is assembling a number of existing information processing concepts to create a new, unique system. So here the title of the paper comes from the inter Assembling the Integrated Data Store. Now, the history is I IDS was conceived, designed, implemented, tested, re implemented, retested, and put into service during the 1961 to 64 timeframe. It turns out there was a very little high-level system of any kind existing then. It was really quite novel. And the IDS first went into production in 1964 at International General Electric. We were using it for an order processing system for shipping international orders in New York City. And General Electric Wiring Devices Department in Pubs, Rhode Island, who did wall switches and things like that. Things, very different type products. And so that, let me just stop here for a minute. Early in the game, we had a series of what we called IDS horror stories. Now, that doesn't sound very good, but the, we had some experiences. In fact, one of the, the first IDS horror story came out of International General Electric. And GE sells all kinds of things. And so that every once in a while in their processing, they're running IDS quite happily. And all of a sudden the system stopped them and just got slower and slower and slower. And they couldn't understand what was going on, so they, they were downtown Manhattan, New York. And we were uptown, said, well, get the taxis, what's going on? Well, it turns out what they were processing is an order 
for a diesel electric locomotive that came with 2,000 spare parts. So an order of this nature came, and so and there was a, from the order record, there were some item, spare part item records that were logically associated with it. And we were using linked lists to tie these all together. And so, as it turns out, they defined this set as being sorted. And the orders came in, and you sort item one. Order item one, like that. Order item two, one, two. Order one, two, three. One, two. When you get to 2,000, it takes some time to walk through a lot of pages of this file to find the end. So then I said, what are we going to do? I said, well, if you go back over here, there's a parameter on this set ordering. You say, they tell it to store last. And we knew they were coming in a numerical sequence. In this case, every time I got a new, new item in the order, where's the last one? Insert right there. No one good. Where's the new last one there? So by changing some of the optimization parameters available to us, we were able to solve this problem, which was a horror until they, figured, until they felt they were out of business all of a sudden. Now, the same sense of horror stories, wiring devices had their horror story too. And you know, no one had experience to know what. I, I thought I knew the right way to design a database, but I had no real experience at it. No one had any real experience. So, wiring devices department called one day and said, Our system is getting slower and slower, and we don't know what our problem is. So, I didn't go down there with one of the people I'm working with them. They said, Well, what's going on? They said, what? Well, they've written all these programs to get new orders and customers and whatnot. And I said, What about the programs that get rid of old orders? Well, they hadn't written those yet. <laughs> so, in fact, they were filling the database up. So each time we got new orders, it's harder and harder to find space to store the order on the disk file. And they got to the point where there was no space left for it to hold, big enough to hold one order. Well, again, they said, okay, stop where you are, quickly write a program to get rid of the old orders that are all completed. I don't care what you do with them, get them out of there. And again, you know, in a matter of a day, they were back in business. But, you know, it was a horror, it was a nightmare until they got that worked out. So these people, each of them, is a, we're all learning. Tell you because we were learning from scratch. There was no history behind before us. Next one, please. Now, IDS went through version one and version two. Most people are not aware of that. But the situation here is that the first IDS, in some sense, was the most elegant in its implementation because it had a, a preprocessor that would take the data description language statements and read them in and store them in an IDS database. Then when you came to your application program, it read your application program, and when it came to an IDS statement, it would say, okay, it would then look, look at the nature of the statement, look at the design details in the database, and it would construct inline statements in GCOM or assembly language if, the, if GCOM didn't understand what to do in this case, and it would expand that statement inline. So it said, this will be the fastest, most efficient implementation, because we don't have to go through all of interpretive things. And so we built it that way, and and so your data description was loaded once, and, they and it worked well in all the tests. In fact, one of the things we had, people didn't have a feeling for how fast is fast, or how slow is slow. But the people from the internal automation operation, IAO, which is a corporate staff group who were doing helping as in-house consultants in GE, had built a <laughs> a manufacturing control system, one of these custom systems for the laminated products he makes, like countertops for kitchens, a material you glue on top of the plywood. And they had spent a long time, you know, more than a year, in putting this system together for the GE department. And they were real pretty proud of it. They said, that's great, but it, it was hopelessly expensive in terms of resources. So Bill Helgeson, who was the lead IAO guy, Bill Holly may have met Bill Helgeson someplace along the line. Uh, said, you know, if, it, if what the customer was twice as fast as IDS, or IDS is twice as slow, if you, that's okay because we can save them enough labor to justify it. Well, it turns out when we took a benchmark data out of the laminated products database and programmed the parts explosion thing again, the typical, we ran twice as fast as their customer. And one of the reasons is because they had not, no idea of what virtual memory was, or the fact that if you have virtual memory, you can bring in three or four pages, or maybe ten pages, that are all going to be frequently accessed. You can build a working set 
which is much more fair to navigate around this working set in memory than to go out each time keep bringing something new in and reconstructing this working set over and over. So even though our interpretive system, like this is before this was running in term, all this code it was accepted, wasn't accepted. So we, then we ran this thing and they just left this IAO people became converts to help us market the system. And in fact, they sold it in a number of different GE departments. Next one, please. Now, IDS version 2 came about because Bill Helgeson said that one you got, IDS 1, is lovely, beautiful, works nicely, but it takes, it requires a 16K configuration. 16K, well, it's actually 48 bytes, because they're 20, 20 character words. And uh, that's too expensive. The GE departments can't afford a machine that big. So you've got to reprogram this thing in a way you can let, operate successfully in an 8K system. And we agreed to do it. Now, in hindsight, I think it's probably the worst decision we ever made. But it, it succeeded because IDS was up and operational. And, it, and what happened really, because the thing would, the new version would run with an interpretive set of subroutines that would look at a small in core version of the data description. And it, you said you want to store something, but then look here and manipulate this thing to find out what it had to do with And then it would execute all those instructions interpretively instead of in line. But it, it turns out we get all the IDS subroutines and the problem control all in the first 4K memory. That left the other, other 4K of an 8K machine to be part program and part buffer. Now, this one, which should run slower, ran faster. We want to figure out why, because people really got a 16K machine, and now they got lots of buffers. They can build a big working set to work on. And it would run much faster than what we used this expanding the program into. So the trade-off that we had not anticipated. Now, in today's computers, well, maybe they're so fast that they make a difference whether they're interpreting or not. And maybe there's memory so big that they're bumping out of problems. I don't know what's the right answer. Either one that works and doesn't cause problems. So the IDS version 2 ran faster than because of smaller, allowing more paging buffers. Now, back to assembling this new thing. IDS, a new, unique assembly. And I'm going to go through here. A number of these are features that we stole from something at a record level virtual memory and blocked records that direct accessing used database keys. So I can take the database key and go directly knew where to go in the disk to get it and bring it back in. Or go check and see if it's in memory already and access it. The calculated addressing using primary keys, so I get I just knew the order number or the customer code or some of that type I could go find that very efficiently. We had a network data structures with the data manipulation language, a DML, the description control and integrity, the DDL would not allow anybody to get anything that's not allowed to do. Had a link implemented owner member sets. And there's many ways you can implement owner member sets. But at that time, in fact it still works pretty well. Owner member sets, linked implementation. We have database navigation using the sets and send us current records. So I, re here's, I retrieve a record, and this record is, is in several sets, and the owner is going to find the first member. If I'm a member, well, I'm going to want to find the owner. And that record became the current record. And that that way I can navigate again in some direction. And so that's the way that IDS worked in terms of a navigational system. And that IDS used a working storage, working storage with a COBOL concept and also a GCOM concept mediate between the application programs and control access to page buffers and database. So an application program could not get through this boundary. They could put stuff into working storage. They could take stuff out of working storage. But only IDS could interface the working storage also and put things in paging buffers and out to the disk. So we, it was pretty hard for a programmer to write. They could do some stupid things, but they couldn't do anything that was lethal to the database. The stupid things usually undo, the lethal things are harder. And it's also we had a, something called data independence, which we'll not talk about too much today. But if you come to the presentation next week on Tuesday, we'll have some talk about data independence. All right, next one, please. Now, Friday Atlas computer, with its backing store, inspired our IDS virtual memory approach to record level, direct addressing in a large database. If some guy read about this, and uh, we looked at the timeline, it was downstairs that way, 
And it said the atlas showed up on that timeline about 1965. But my knowledge of that for the atlas came by 1960, so it must have been publicized well. It may have existed in prototype form or maybe earlier. But the idea of a paging member, in their case, used for storing programs. And in fact, it turns out most virtual memories, even to the year 2008, are used directly for program storage and very little for database storage. And the database timing characteristics require a different kind of page turning algorithm than the computerized virtual memories use. So even if you look at something in a database and two virtual memory, there's really two, data, two virtual memories out there. A software implemented one for databases and hardware implemented one for programs. IDS in the first version had a record address space of one million records with garbage collection to recover record identifiers and page storage space that had been used by deleted records. And this is based on the GD204 disk file, which had 10 million characters. It was really impressive. Now, one of the, one of the many tricks, in fact, remembering back to the early magnetic tape days, Univac had a real advantage over IBM on one factor, at least. And on IBM magnetic tape, they wrote fixed length blocks, which had one, two, three, or ten, or how many records had fit into that fixed length. So when you write a block in, you got some more than one record. IBM's tape processing system had one logical record per block. So you had to do a tape start and stop for every record you wanted. And that slows the heck out of things. So having learned that lesson or read about that lesson, in fact, I said, we're talking about we learn things by listening all over the industry and what could be useful. So in our virtual memory system, we had a paging system, a page or a block, if you like it. But because we thought there was a virtual memory and we had pages, and in terms of the records, had line numbers. We had lines and pages, it made sense. And that was our record identifier. So this meant that if you, in some cases, you could store a purchase order, and all the line items in the purchase order could go on the same page. So one disk access could bring you the whole order and all the line items. And this, again, helped provide us performance. And so this page turning algorithm I talked about earlier, if I kept track of which of these pages have been used most frequently, I kept a list. So every time I use a page, I put it at the top of my list. And if I don't use it, it kind of drops to the bottom of the list. And when it gets to the bottom, I need a new buffer, empty buffer. I'll either write that back to the disk file or just drop it. But you kept the most frequently used pages in memory in the buffers. And this, again, is a way to preserve that. And that wasn't a new trick. That was just another one we picked up from other people to take advantage of things. Next one, please. Now, another thing that IDF did that was new at that time, and if you ever programmed in GCOM or Comtran or more recently in COBOL, COBOL or the COBOL system never couldn't recognize a record and say, oh, you're a payroll record or you're a deduction record or you're a paycheck record. You just read the next record. It's up to your program to figure out what it is and then move it to work and storage appropriately. I said, well, that's kind of a dangerous thing because that means that a programmer can make a mistake in here and send something to the wrong place. So we said, Listen, we're going to have a record where every record stored in the database has its own record type code embedded in it in a way that nobody could get at it and change it. Not even IDS had any way to change a transaction type. Someone could delete a record and store another record of a different type, that's fine. But you couldn't make a mess out of the database by mis and some mistake changing its record type code. Now this assured that only valid operations as allowed by the data definition descriptions could be executed by the application program that used IDS to create and access data records. Now, we couldn't keep someone from running a program that access the physical disk all by itself. But I think, and I've never heard of anyone doing that and making a mess of things, because everyone was concerned about the security of the system. So they always access the database, IDS databases through IDS itself. Now, calculated addressing was the, one of the first schemes that came up when some of the early disk files came out. And these disk files had the same problem that IBM uh, magnetic tape blocks did. They only held one logical record. And if you look at the 
mathematics behind complicated dressing. They look at a Poisson distribution, which says, you know, if I got a bucket will handle one thing, then I can very easily get, du get duplicates, things almost, two things almost toward the same place. If I have a bucket big enough to handle 10 records, then I have to get, have 10 hits before I have an overflow problem. So that by using a blocked page, clustering records in a page, we made the complicated addressing scheme which had been discarded as being impractical into a practical tool. So people could store records out the primary key retrieval is based on calculating an address and they're going to calculate its actual, actually only calculate the page to find it in. We didn't care which record it was in the page. We just calculate which page it should have been stored in. And if we weren't there, we, we had an overflow pointer saying where to go to. So we could find it next. So this meant we could do calculated addressing to achieve an average of about 1.25 physical disk access to get one effective disk access. That's pretty darn good. Because people before were getting hit maybe five or ten different reads to get to where they're trying to go to. Now later on we found that an innovation had been added by somebody else in our group, an available page inventory meant we could actually build more things in because they handle the overflow easier. Now at the high level data description language, the DDL, we can describe records with a database key, a record type code, various data items, whatever you want to put in it. We have one or more primary keys, although it turns out one primary key was typically all anything ever had because there'd be a hierarchy of primary keys if you think of a racial database sense of if you have two database keys, if you have two primary keys, it's because there's a hierarchy of things. One, one belongs to this record, one belongs to its owner record above it. And then owner member and or memberships and owner member sets. And again, the owner member set had always had one owner and they could have zero, one, or more member records in an ordered set. And that's a significant thing because it, people who were doing ideas were did very little sorting. And if you remember that time, database, uh, data processing systems were full of sort routines, sorting things back and forth. It just ate up a lot of time. IDS applications typically did no sorting at all. Maybe a few, few of the big reporting applications would do, actually extract things and sort them down. But because the things were pre-sorted, you could find them exactly the way you wanted them. I normally retrieve it, so I didn't have to sort it. Get the items in an order, or get the available list of. Well, for instance, one thing that we'll come back to is that if I have a resource item, such as a paint booth, that's scheduled, I got a bunch of scheduled uses of it. When does it start? When does it finish? And when's the next one start? When's it finished? So I can draw a profile. Well, that had to be sorted by start and release times. So I could just walk down that set and find out is there a spot in here big enough to put this paint booth requirement in. So the critical thing is that the ordered sort is something that really made a real difference in applications. Now, oh, I have a new toy. I've never had a laser pointer before. Did it work? Let me hit the right button. Oh. Now, this is a network model, and I said a meta network model, because this is the data model that was used to store the data description language for IDS. It says, if I have an IDS database, and you, and you read this in the back, I doubt it. Then this contains a bunch of record description records. The record description records had a set of field description records. It also had a set of detail record descriptions, and a set of master record descriptions. Master record, and here again, master and detail is an older set of names than owner member. It's only when the outside world got involved and what we're doing is change from master detail, which is punch card technology in words, to owner's member. So this is the owner description record, which can define one or more detail record descriptions. And that things like sort keys and primary keys all ended up being controlled by control description records. Now, this particular structure here is the one that in the original system we stored in the IDS database. And then the data information language translator Caught up over these things to figure out what it meant to store a particular customer record or a particular employee record or a purchase order record, and then generate the inline code to tell it. Now, if we go to the next slide, which is even harder to read, the thing you saw before, this is the description that was in the 
<laughs> data. Now, that information from that was actually stored in that HIDS program. They said the HIDS program has a bunch of worker storage record descriptions that correlate <coughs> the records that we're going to process, and a group of worker storage field definitions that correlate with the field descriptions. It has a group of chain tables, which so we kept track of what's the current record of this particular owner member set. And these all tie back into the these definitions here. And in the same sense, if we look at the physical database itself, here's the IDS database, which have database pages in the virtual memory system, which have IDS data records, which have IDS chain pointers, which represent the IDS looking at owners or looking at members, and then IDS data fields in those records. So these three structures are all in a say, very complex relationships tied the thing together, but, but the whole with this system, if you implemented based on those rules, you could tell exactly what you had to do. And there was actually there, it turns out there were very few programming errors in writing the system to this because the, the solution having defined the model almost kind of fell out for free. And so one of the advantages of having a, a well conceived model of what you're doing was once you get that done, then, you, then I can just go methodically through doing what I have to do with that. And one of the, well, we'll come back to that point later. Oh, not there. Next one, please. Now, when we talk about data structure diagrams, I'll just go back to folks, but the basic part of that provide a graphic means by which instructions can be visualized and documented, and widely communicated through the business community. Because people have to have to know what they're talking about and have to be able to recognize that that's my application. Because one of the hardest things to do is to design a system to go out and tell the accounting department or the marketing department or the management department, now this is their stuff. I don't understand that. <coughs> but people can look at data structure diagrams, and particularly if you, if you introduce them slower, can make it work. In fact, one experience I had is when I was working for GE in Phoenix, Arizona, we had a group of, from a supermarket merchandising chain in Germany in, they're talking to us, and, and I don't know much about department stores and how they operate, but you know, I, I've been in a department store, and I kind of know what I can see when I'm in a department store, and the first thing you know, a department store has departments. So I can start doing a data structure diagram on the blackboard of these people, so they've got a company, and you have stores, and stores have departments. Departments have products they sell. But the products they sell here are come from a larger list of products that they sell in general. And so I could, in a matter of 15, 20 minutes, describe their business to them. Not because I knew their business, how they operated it, but the, I can see the user visible objects. What, what are there to be seen? And at, toward the end of this discussion, one of the, the German prospects said, he asked a question of a translator. Is Mr. Bachman a retail store expert? Because you know, I, I appeared to be an expert. I wasn't an expert beyond what most, but the fact that the description I was giving him, he felt so comfortable with that I must be an expert because I can talk about his business and know so much about it. And the structure diagrams have that ability. Now, there's also a little bit of folklore. Some people are affronted, really almost angry, when you try to introduce them to data structure diagrams. They, well, that's not do. I never can figure out why. And the only thing I can be sure is a clue. Most of the people who had trouble with them were right handed. <laughs> you know, that, that may be just a bad sample I had. But people are right winged and left brained, and certain things are. And the right-handed people seem to have more trouble with this than the left-handed people. Anybody left-handed in the audience? <laughs> anyway, but the, the data structure diagrams could be translated into, directly, into DM, DDL, the control IDS database, and then optimized for best performance. So again, data structure diagrams tend to be a conceptual view of the business, not a physical database view of it. Even though at the time IDS was very much of a 
its structure was almost equivalent to the conceptual. It has the race number of number sets. And therefore, what started out as a diagramming technique for a physical database, or a logical database, which IDS was, but it turned out to be even people who do relational databases, they don't believe in network data models, but they do network oriented data structure diagrams. You know, because those are things we can relate to. Those relations are real. They're in the business or in whatever you're dealing with as a subject. Next one, please. Now, at the high level, the data manipulation language, we had a series of basically four statements, although there's a few variations. They want to store statements in store, that provide a record name and a record, and the system would know what, where to go find the description. Or I guess they retrieve and they'll come back. There's a whole series of different retrieval commands. The purpose always be to get, get me one new record, is my new current record. But there's several options about how you go about getting it, how we designate which one you want. There's a modified record name, and the only way you can change something, in effect, is to put a new value into working storage where the old value was. And say so you want to modify the record, and the idea else would pick that new value up and store it. And if it happened to be a primary key you're changing, it would go about and change the primary key relationship and whatnot. Or the delete, which would remove the actual record from the database. Now, the statements written in line with regular business programming language statements provide a seamless, procedurally oriented approach to data processing. And that's what worked quite well. Let's look at the next one, please. Now let's just walk for a minute through what a store command would do for you. Well, first of all, it determines whether the record or the storing the new record would violate the duplicate record declarations. The duplicate records and primary keys were not allowed. It brings the virtual memory page recommended for the new record or an alternate page into an empty virtual memory buffer. It assigns virtual memory space and establishes a record skeleton with its virtual memory address and record type code. It moves the data content of the new record from the record types work storage area, establishes the new record as the owner record of its owner member sets. It can be an owner of several different sets. But again, those sets would be empty at the time you stored the, the owner record. It inserts the new record as a member record into its owner member sets based on its foreign key values and positions based on the record's ordering rules. You can tell either I want to store this as the first record in the set or the last record in the set or sorted by what sort keys you've defined or after the current record. So I said, here's the record, I want you to put it here so you can have very intimate control over where it went. Or I can do it after the current record. It updates the record and set currency tables, which keeps track of what the current record is. In fact, it keeps track of the current record of every record type that you've accessed. And it reports any errors again that could happen. So if I try to store something, it would be a duplicate. It holds its hand up and says, I'm sorry about that. So it reports it back to the programmer. And the programmer shouldn't do that very often before the program been, been debugged for that type of error. Now, when we talk about controlled access to data, a series of working storage areas, one for each record type, provided the space where application programs and IDS and DML subroutines could securely exchange record area data and control information. This is that security mechanism we talked about earlier. So I could look at a statement. And GCOM said, move the field name of a particular record name to a user field name. So I think it out of working storage and put it up here so I can find it now. Or I can say, if some of my program's work areas, fields, equals the field name of some record name, then go to some level. So I, use so I can access the working storage area in the normal programming language statements. But I, I could only change them by moving things into it or moving things out. I could not do anything with the valid action. Now, the retrieve command, that's something sort of, you know, I'm going to need to sit down. My, at age 33, I don't stand in one place very long before it becomes tiresome. John, uh, thank you. Drink of water, yes. Are you really 33? 83. Oh, okay. <laughs> and in two months, I'll be 84. And getting up and standing up and sitting down are one of my trials. 
I recommend armchairs whenever possible. They're easier to get out of. Now, I have to go to where things going on. All right, the retrieve command brings the page of the specified record into an empty virtual memory buffer. It locates that record with your board within that page. It moves the content of that record into the record types working storage area. It updates the currency table now, with the new current record of this type. It makes known the record type name and database key and the record retrieved. It makes it known to the program so it can make whatever decisions are appropriate for that information. And again, reports any errors. So all the IDS commands had an error tag on it. You could check to see if there's an error for whatever reason. And you've got a program, something to check if there's an error. But most errors you could make are due to programming errors. And once you got them cleaned up, it, they weren't very active. Didn't need to be. Now, the retrieve command came with a number of options. Because there are numbers of different ways you could tell which record you want to deal with. The first one up here says retrieve record name record. Now that means retrieve whatever name you put in it. Whether it's an item record, or a purchase order record, or a personnel record, or an order record. Put in whatever the record name is that's been described in your data descriptions. And they would look at that description and say, oh, now what do I know about this record that satisfies its unique retrieval? And it would say, well, if it's got a payroll record, it's the employee number. So it would use that information to go down to a particular subroutine for retrieval. If it says I want to retrieve the current record, record name, that means that even though I've got a current record of program, we have a current record of five or six other record types I've retrieved in this program earlier. I want to go back to that current payroll record, that current resource record. And then that, whatever record I retrieve is going to become the new current record of program. Or I could say retrieve the next record of a set name. So I'm sitting here looking at a purchase order to retrieve the next record of the customer order set. And I'll get the next purchase order, and so on. Or in fact, I could, all the ideas change in the sense where endless loops. One owner record, first member, second member, last member, last member pointed back to the owner. So we never got anything in loss control. In fact, even if you said I want to retrieve prior record of set name, and you had specified you want those records stored with a prior pointer in them, it would run around forward until it found that prior record. It was functionally a complete statement. It just wasn't optimally implemented. Although it is a very rare thing to happen, it might still be the optimal way to do it if the sets weren't a thousand records long, which some were. Or I could say retrieve the prior record of set name. Now retrieve owner record of set name means I'm, presumption I'm sitting on a member record of that set. I want to go directly, I may not physically go there directly, I may run around the set to get to the owner. Or I may have a pointer going to the owner, depending on what I've declared there. But it means the record I want is the owner of this set to become my current record. Now the retrieve each record of record name is one that lets me go through the database one record at a time. So I essentially can scan the whole database for a record type. And for some reporting purposes, that was very handy. We're going to go through all the customer records one by time. Now that set would not be in database sequence. They would not be in customer code sequence. Although you might someplace else have a chain, a set of all the customers that I could put in customer code sequence. Now one of the interesting ones at the top was the retrieve record name record. One of the unusual variations of that was that I just had what was called a one of a kind record that you could describe. Which means you could only store one record of that type. After you stored one, you couldn't store any more of them. And so it would embed the database key of that one record in the data descriptions. So whenever you said I want to find record name of this kind of one of a kind record, you knew exactly where to go get it. And a lot of people would put in what they call system records. Which means, in a sense, I want to keep track of all the customers. Well, I'll maybe create a system record which all the customers are linked to. And maybe all the orders are also linked to it and all the employees. But it's a one of a kind record. But if I want to start thinking through that set, I could go there. So we had this wide variety of options. 
In fact, what you would find in this architecture is a part of a philosophy that has always stuck with me. I didn't like systems until you, you, you couldn't do something because I later thought it was I thought it wasn't a useful thing to do. I'm going to say, if it's something that you can do, and it's, even though it might be unfrequent or even stupid, I can't forecast all the possible applications. So I, I tended to omit all the possible combinations of these things, and the system, you know, mechanically would carry out whatever you said. And maybe that co some combination were never used. But I figured it wasn't my job to say you can't use them. That was, that was an undesirable design criteria to be smarter than your customers are. Try to be as, sm as smart as you hope to be, but not be impossibly smart. Next, please. Now, in implementing the owner member sets, there are again several linking options. And I'm going to go back to the retrieve next, retrieve prior, retrieve owner. What, what, first of all, each record pointing to the next record was a standard. You got that by default. Till Bob Blose at IG said, I want a case where the, all the records don't have that. This is one of the cases I had not thought of. And probably outlawed because it was irrational. Um, who's to decide what's irrational? So I, try, I tried not to. <coughs> so that would, by the way, every record had a next pointer, a complete loop around. And you could add to that the option that every record had a prior pointer. In fact, I think in the IDS2 that, that General Electric implemented later, based on the gold specification, they made that also, that every record had both a next and prior pointer. And as something thought this, well, they, they may have spent more time going around to existing IDS users to find out whether everyone else was doing that anyway. But that, anyway, that was an option to have, have optional prior pointer, but no longer optional at the time that um, IDS2 came out. You'd have an order pointer that pointed to the last member. This is exactly the case of International General Electric I told you about, where they want each new item on the push order for a locomotive or a crate of lamp bulbs and point to the prior one. So I could always put one at the end very easily, very efficiently. Or we could have each record that would point to the owner record. So a frequent point, pointing a member record through one set, and I want to go to the owner of that set, I could that's a frequent thing to happen. I can then set it up so it's already a member pointer. And what Bob Blois wanted to do was have each member record had going to the owner, but didn't have the first option. And he had an application where he, in fact, implemented that himself. Because that fit his application. It's much easier to create a new record if all you have to do is know where the, where the owner is, because then you can just collect that information and store it in the record and off it goes. And all these pointers that we're using were, were, were virtual memory addresses. That's as efficient as you can get to get some off the disk. If you know where it is, then zap. Next one, please. Now, one of the things that struck us, and sometimes in hindsight you see what you did better than you did when you first did it, is it discovered, we discovered that IDS changed the notion of what was input and what was output. Historically, input had been into the program, and output was out of the program. The IDS is different than that. Input means into the database. The database is the permanent thing out here. And I can either modify data that's new data in the database, that's input, or store records input. If I copy record information, no, that's output. Or if I delete records, that's output. So the, the, the input and output took out a new meaning, a new mindset. And uh, this back at the time that I wrote the lecture for the ACM on the programmer as navigator. It really in the same sense a programmer on a navigator on a ship. He doesn't bring the ship into it, he takes the ship out onto the world to get places. In this case, it's the programmer takes his program into the database. He's the navigator. And so he's going into and going around. Next one, please. So here we are, navigating the database. This was the fundamental paradigm by which we operated on a record by record and set by set basis. And the owner member sets linking records in a meaningful way provide the means for the subject of this navigation. So people who, again, IDS was designed on the basis you knew what you needed to do for this application. 
you knew all the relationships that were pertinent in the business. And you created owner member sets to recognize these relationships. And then you implemented them so that you can now navigate through these things as the program required it. And in some cases, you may have gotten some owner member sets that were not used frequently. But you know, they were there and you, you paid and did storage time for their cost. And though you, even though you didn't save much time in retrieval time, you didn't retrieve very often. Next one, please. Now, to give us a couple examples out of my acts, creating an order structure was the kind of thing we said we needed this CPM network structure for. The next slide. Okay, I get to use my pointer again. Oh, I have to hold the button down. Well, I think this thing, this is a structure of an order. I think about having a manufacturing shop or an assembly shop or a paint shop or even an engineering department, some place where they manage certain resources. And resources are characterized as something I can use, but after I finish, I can reuse it. It's a reusable item. And very different than a material item which is consumed in the process. And the interesting thing, if I look at customers who have orders or things they want to buy, and for each order, there's one or more production steps involved. Now, production steps may require resources to be executed, or they may require material items to be there so I can assemble them. But one of the interesting things back here is that a resource requirement has a start date. When am, I, when am I scheduled to start using this resource item? And when am I scheduled to complete them? So there's one set here, one order member set that has the same record type appearing twice in it. And there aren't many examples of this I know of, but this is one that, and in fact, the rule says here, this double bar says that if I have records connected this way, it also must have a relationship this way. I can have a resource item scheduled to be used and not scheduled to be released after use. So that the whole thing, production step, you use resources, use material items, which came out of inventory, and the overall inventory, if it was low, would say, I want to create a production order for inventory purposes. So inventory may need to make production orders as well as customers. Next one, please. Now, this is the same diagram on the right we had. Here's a resource item. Oh, excuse me. Yeah, it's the, it's the, um, sorry. Yeah, the left one, excuse me. This is the factory plan over here. But how do you get factory plans? You have to create them from a template. So the template for making factory plans, and again, you think this is being part of a big partner CPM diagram structure, is that on this side I have a resource planning record or resource types which have resource requirements required by some production step type, which also has material requirements. Let's feed back up here. So the resource type here, there is some item of that type. In fact, we can follow here this item resources over here, and here's an example of it. So this is, this type would happen to be a, a big uh, boring mill, and I might have three boring mills of that type that are available for scheduling. And if it's not available, I can't schedule it. So it's important to know whether it's committed to something already. The same way I have a material item, if I need to make more of them, I need to know what kind of production order I'm going to need what kind of steps in order to make that material item. So that what was new in the sense of the low quality switchgears engineering department, they had to create for us this kind of prototype plan they'd never seen before. You know, they had paper records and whatnot, but they never thought of that being computerized. And in fact, what's not shown here is they also had structured planning. So if you said, I want a circuit breaker with certain characteristics, then, and the, the planning, in effect, was tied up here. It had a sequence of variations of that plan. So I picked one of the plans, and then I could use that same selection criteria all the way through to see what requirements I had for raw materials, for resources. So one set of manufacturing might do a whole family of similar circuit breakers to make the engineering more efficient, and again, to make it more consistent. 
because if I can have a group of products which have interchangeable parts in some cases, which have the same kind of evaluation in terms of rating, voltage or amperage or interruptibility, then I can make more consistent engineering, I can make more efficient manufacturing, and presumably either make a, manu a lower manufacturing cost, either make a bigger profit, or sell it more competitive with somebody else. Next one. Now, I said that three people, Stan Williams, myself, and Homer Carney, start out with the MyX project. Stan Williams went off and focused his attention on the manufacturing control application part of it. I inherited the database and operating system part. And Homer Carney, who was the only one who had any programming experience when we started, was the chief programmer. But it turns out Homer did the virtual memory part of the system, I did the IDS engine part of it. And in fact, one of the questions when I made this presentation, an earlier version of it, to the Computer Association, associates, the CA people in uh, Needham, Massachusetts, who inherited IDMS from Colony. My first question was, how many programmers do you have on the project? I said, two. They laughed because they have about 16 people on it now. Because, of course, a lot of stuff grew up around it. So it's not quite the same product, but in the core, as far as I can tell, it's the same product. Except they don't have all the options for retrieval I had. And notice they've lost a couple of them. Or the retrieve uh, record has only become retrieve calc. That's the only way they use it now. All right, so four things here. One, the International General Electric created a recovery and restart capability. Very, very important capability because neither the application programs nor uh, the, the disks and the computers are perfect. Now, to be honest with you, once IDS was released in the field, I do not remember ever coming back with a programming fault in IDS. Now, maybe I initially forgot that. If I don't remember that, I think I would have remembered. Now, we had IDS horror problems based upon people who, who didn't understand the subtlety of some of the optimal, optimizing choices. And at this time, the computers were small. They weren't small physically, they were small like station wagons and whatnot, but they were small in terms of computer storage and small and slow, and you had to, every count, every beat of the heart of that thing was important. So we did put a lot of effort into giving you a sort of choice to optimize it. And one of the things that IDS found difficult later on is that IDS was harder to use in relational databases. We didn't have to plan very far ahead. You just build something, add something to it, and when the computers got bigger and faster, performance was less important. And so people said, okay, we'll just do this. And, and people want faster applications, and anyway. And so first of all, they, they did the before and after images. This meant they had a tape drive set up alongside that every time a page was brought in and was going to be updated, they would quickly write a copy of that page, the before image, before it was changed out to the tape. Every tape would do that. At the same time, every time a page had been modified for it to be written back to the disk, and write an after image back to the same magnetic tape. Now this provided the mechanism so if you had a disk file failure, you could go back and say, I'm going to roll back to where we were and get a correct image of it. Or if the application program blew up for some reason. In fact, one of the early programming mistakes people made, they didn't quite know how to stop a program. In fact, G225 did not have a stop command. You think, well, computers also should have stop commands. The only thing I, the G225 had was that you could branch from this statement back to the same statement. So you stop in place. The computer was still running executions there, but it wasn't advancing anywhere. So that people would somehow, the program was not quite finished, they would not, essentially the program would not close and go back to the operating system to say, what do, what do you want to do next? So the, it was very important that they could recover both from application program failures and hardware failures. IG also introduced a page inventory scheme so that they could, if a page you were going to store something that was full, the 
out my algorithms to look at the next page, and then the next page, the next page. It took a long time to look at the next page, and they got to the whole disk, find there was no space. So they stole a few pages from the total page available. He said, at each page, I'm going to take one byte, or one character in that case, to oh, six bytes, six bits, I should say, and encode in that six bits just how much space was available on a particular page. So they, they could think, one pattern of bits would say this thing is, uh, I want to express it as less than, more than half, less than half full. The next bit pattern is less than three quarters full, less than three quarters, okay, three, five eighths of state. So on down, it was very little full. So they could look at this very quickly and find the page, next page in the sequence that had room, enough room for this next one record to be stored. This helped a lot in performance. It also meant we could put more calculated records in because we could port to other pages. If we had overflow, we could get to find them where they were quicker. Uh, IGE, the International General Electric Group, came up with something they called, well, they called FAST ideas. Now, FAST ideas was faster than ideas, which I programmed. But if you were looking at a page in IDS and you wanted record number 13 in that page, you look at record number one, figure how long it was, record number two, how long was it, number three, and it's a very liable way to get to record 13. Uh, and record 14 and 15 and beyond it. It wasn't the fastest way to get there. And uh, I must say, I was concerned about functionality in some cases, and someone else, and so the people, Bill Helgens in particular, and IEO said, we're going to put an array at the bottom of the page, an array of pointers. So the first pointer pointed to the first record, the record of the first line number. The second pointer pointed to the second line number. So these records could be anywhere in the page. There could be gaps between them. It didn't make any difference. And only when the page was considered to be reached the point that it needed to be, you could do a garbage collection on the page, collapse it all again. You didn't have to sort them in sequence. So it, it was much quicker to do some things, and so that became a standard feature. And again, people had extra brains coming, to, extra time coming in. And finally, the third, last thing down here I had to list that IAO, in terms of automation, produced what they call range masters. Uh, and they were a birch, who was infamous for selling and looking like a Texan. I didn't have a cowboy hat on, but he was definitely from Texas, he sounded like it. And Herbert said, I've got these long sets of orders in my thing. And if I want to have an order set of records, that's awful slow to insert things in there. So I said, if I, I can build an indexing system, so I can have a level in, one level index is above the actual purchase orders down here. So they go down so like, a, like a binary tree. But they weren't binary, they're inner trees. And I can maybe put two or three levels of indexes of this thing. And uh, if I could do that, I could get, make this long set much more efficient to use. Well, it took a, a change of about five lines of code to make that work. Now, the simple reason comes back to this. They retrieve record name. Rec work not only for one-of-a-kind records, but for records based on their primary code, primary key. But also, if I, the way it was that better in the first place, if I look for a record as a line number Five and a purchase order, one, two, three, four. I can go to one, two, three, four, find it, then go to line five. Well, he said, well, these are all find the uniquely the purchase order number, then find uniquely the line order number. He says, well, if you could change that, looking for a unique value, or looking for a unique value, or a greater value, then I can use put a, I can use IDS to build these intermediate level master records. I build the index uh, using just standard IDS stuff and insert the intermediate records, and they would then give you a chance to go quickly through first level index, second level index, down to the last maybe 10 records that are all part of the longer sequence of orders and sequence. So these guys all added important things. And to my knowledge, I said that because sometimes you, you get partly out of the mainstream what's going on, you don't up with all these going on. These are the major improvements that were put in. 
And I do know that IDL, excuse me, IDMS uses these this, this improved uh, page, inventory pages and the ability to find the uh, and the expedited page type. Those two techniques are, are went all the way to IDMS. They're still there in the way IDMS operates today. I and I know that this range masters doesn't exist because they don't have the retrieve record name anymore. I don't know why, but for some reason someone thought either they didn't understand it and dropped out what it was doing. But anyway, those are very helpful additions to help make IDS a productive system. Next, please. Now, there are two more chapters that fit in this picture. <coughs> that uh, Weyerhaeuser Lumber, which was a huge Tacoma, Washington lumber company, who has huge forests it owns and huge forests that licenses all over the United States and up into Canada. And it makes two befores or whatever dimensional lumber you make. It makes plywood, it makes wood pulp, it does all kinds of wood byproducts. But in the early time frame, 1966, they wanted an online order processing system. And that's a long time ago. And they said, well, IDS and the problem controller as you have it can do exactly what we want to do, but we can't depend on having just the card reader and the card punches input output devices. And they said, we'll get a DataNet 30 device with the communication controller that GE made, and it's actually connected to a torn tape teletype system with teletypes in the mills, in the warehouses, in the sales offices, in the headquarters. And they could all send teletypes to each other if they wanted to. Or they could send teletypes to the warehouser version of MyX, which was their magic metric control system and order processing system. And it ran handsomely. You know, it accepted orders and told the warehouse to ship them, and they shipped them and fed back and ran quite nicely. But they just caused havoc in the Tacoma Computer Center because they had no online I.O. devices. And the operators were totally frustrated. They said, what's this thing? I said, light's blinking. But what's going on? I can't tell. The disk's moving. And they couldn't tell it was a loop. They said, they put it in there. Well, they put on a selectric typewriter. And once an hour, they had to type out the queue of transactions still to be processed. If it changed from one hour to the other, it's roughly running. But you know, it, it was one of those things, it was really a standalone system. And it ran day and night, week all week long. And to my knowledge, it had no schedule of maintenance time. And I don't know, I said, to my knowledge. But I do know that one point in the game, when I was talking to a gentleman who was the vice president of Weyerhaeuser, who was responsible for the information technology and other things in that technology area, he said at one time in their history with this first GE 235 system, that they had a, all of a sudden a surge of new orders coming in. They were coming in faster than the GE 235 computer could, could handle them. So on Monday, they'd start out with an empty queue, and Monday morning, the, the queue would build up and build up and build up. So actually, even though it was running overnight processing orders, it still couldn't get all the orders processed before Tuesday morning orders started coming in. And so it collected orders on Tuesday and processed the orders. Some money orders got out, and Tuesday orders started getting out. And on Tuesday, and they got more orders overnight Wednesday. So actually, by Saturday morning, they had a lot of orders left still to be done. And I said, the thing you ought to understand that at this time when these orders are backing up, we still could get a new order code, a new customer code assigned in about 15 seconds because of priority sequencing of these transactions. So they set up their priority structure based on the company need. And if they couldn't get an order processed until tomorrow, they couldn't get it processed until tomorrow. They had no choice. But they didn't want to hold a customer up because they couldn't enter an order unless the new customer had a customer code. So this system, and they said, well, they didn't understand this thing because it happened at a time when they had cut back on field salespeople for some reason. But the thing did empty itself out by Monday morning. But it also made them very nervous about where they went because they wanted to grow the business. So the next step in the game came along with the next slide. 
or they needed greater throughput. So they actually said, let's go to a GE 635 computer, which is a much bigger, faster computer than the 225 was. 36-bit machine looked very much like a IBM 6, uh, 704 or 709, and that vintage of computer, same similar architecture. With, again, the Theta 30 communication controller, IDS, and the problem controller. And we had a project to build it up so they could run IDS concurrently, more than one transaction running simultaneously with other transactions. <coughs> with all the possibility that two programs get tangled in each other's hair. But it was set up so they had a system so if a program accessed a record, it could lock that record until the transaction finished. So it could build up its working set and do its processing and finish the transaction and release all those records. Now, if it locks a record, some other transaction came along and wanted a locked record, that record program would be held be in deadlock condition, be held until the other program finished, then it would resume its processing. If in fact, in program A, which locked a record program B wanted, and program B was waiting for program A, and program A is still running and wanted a record that program B had locked, we'd have a deadlock situation. The system actually would look at it and say, well, we have a deadlock. What we can do, we can roll both of these programs, no, it didn't roll both of them, roll one of them back, the one that had been running the least time and unlock the record that it was waiting for, let it run to completion, and start this transaction over again. And they ran this thing this way, and it was pretty, quite successful getting more productivity because a 635 was a much faster computer. And they could run more transactions against a, actually a bigger database, they had more data by this time, and get more work, more pro orders processed, more things going through. And one of the interesting footnotes is that they programmed this to say, shall we lock the, the database at the record level, or should we lock it at the page level? Because if we lock it, lock it at the record level, there'll be fewer deadlocks detected. Because be less actual, because we lock at the page level, we'll have artificial interference. We're not really looking for the same record, we're just looking for the same page. Well, it turns out that the bookkeeping of operating at the record level compensated for that, so they actually got fewer transactions through locking at the record level than at the page level. They end up running at the page level because they take more, more deadlock detection, more recovery and restart, with they got more transactions completed in an hour that way. Next one. Now, just to kind of wind this up because we're taking a lot of your time up. We're, I've used it generously because I've heard I had time. Uh, to kind of say the exponential growth at one kind of one year, two, four, eight, fifteen, and the continued exponential growth of IDS usage in General Electric. In 1970, I quit because that's the year that General Electric sold its business, its computer business to Honeywell. And I was more dis working on a new product line, which I had to work on for GE, and then Honeywell took over. So I was not very close to what was going on, but they're still growing in quite some numbers. Now, Somewhat in parallel to this, and Bill Ali was involved in this, the Codicil Database Task Group wrote a specification late in the 60s based on IDS. It was implemented by a number of companies worldwide. It's very unique kind of version. GE's version was called IDS2. Uh, IBM mainframe version, actually, which came out of IDS through BF Goodrich Rubber, was based on IDS. So there are quite a few systems around the world. And in fact, I began checking a couple of years ago, I put this first thing together and said, well, what's going on? I haven't paid attention to where IDS is today. So I typed in IDS to Google and uh, got some feedback, IDS from Bull, which kind of owns the IDS line now and the whole Honeywell line. And in fact, it seems that Bull and IDS still own banking in Norway because most of the banks are still IDS sites because, again, they're bank transaction processing. And so they're still running that thing quite successfully. And I also found out that in Korea, I said, well, look, look for IDMS also, and found out that they were going that, that spring of 2005, I guess. 
that there was going to be an IDS user meeting. Oh, I said, they're still alive in Denver. So I, they gave a reference to who to call, contact the meeting, and I called the man up, and he said, oh, you don't want to come to our meeting. You want to go to the I, I, International IDMS meeting in Dallas this summer. I said, oh, IDMS International meeting. So I called the spo sponsor of that meeting, and uh, he told me all about it. He said, invited me to come, and I said, you want me to come and give you uh, keynote speech, I brought this presentation along, or again, an earlier version of it. But if we go to the next one here, slide. Can you click and play one more on there, John? We come down through this, I say yesterday, day, and tomorrow, we come 61 all the way to, in 2006, there were either 750 IDS, IDMS sites worldwide, and I've also heard 1,000, I'm not sure which number, but they said that British Telecom, BT, reputedly had the, according to somebody's survey, either the second or third largest online transaction system in the world, running a huge IBM configuration. And they said, well, you know, but there's still 750 IDMS sites running it. It's not dead, it must be alive and healthy. So actually, I have a meeting scheduled tomorrow morning with British Telecom to ask them, tell me about how this thing managed to survive. For 45 years, <laughs> you know, they say we send the old computers to the computer museum, and old data goes to work every night. And, th and this again, this the business of the same data they had 45 years ago, changes of course, extensions. But I'm, I'm very anxious to go, and and then they said, well, some people BT said, well, we can't come to your meeting this afternoon. Could you give us 20 minutes of your talk? So we'll run this thing tomorrow afternoon for BT. Then I'll have my list of questions for them. I'll try to fill out the history. How did you get the IDS in the first place? What are your horror stories of IDS? You know, what, what went wrong for you? You learned about what, what's going well. Why are you still using it? Why haven't you gone to something else? DB2. I, I think I know some of these answers. I know the man from. The international meeting who actually works for Ross Perot, the Perot Data Systems in Texas, said they've tried twice to get off IDMS and failed both times. <laughs> now, uh, that was a, what do you really mean they failed? The new system didn't run as well. Uh, you never could find it. One thing, you can't find IDS programs. And that's one of the problems that people don't want to learn a 45 year old language. So I'm interested in filling in this story, which is, so next one, what's it say? I know. British Telecom tomorrow, that's where we're going. Next one, talk about data structure diagrams. Have you done that already? I want to say thank you. Now, can you read this diagram? <laughs> <laughs> Who's a whole volunteer? Bill Ali will be cheating, he knows. A data structure diagram. Yeah. Okay, let's read this. Said so that we have BCS members. We know what they are. We know what questions are. And so the BCS members may have questions, and, and questions may be asked by BCS members. So we have a question and answer period now for those questions that you've been swallowing for the last hour and a half. Yes. That you bring in in your presentation, you bring in the, the subject of data recovery, recovery from failure, quite late in your presentation. And clearly, this reflects the way in which the system developed. But I'm intrigued to know how the system ever worked without that being there. Because well, but see, it didn't work very long. Uh, it, I'd say days and weeks. Uh, because the first system to come up was International General Electric. In fact, they, they may have been designing their recovery and restart from the moment they looked at it. Because they, they had a real business to run. And they, and so I was sitting with a different hat on it than they were. They had day-to-day -day responsibility. And so they started plugging the gaps that I had missed. In fact, the computer we worked didn't have any tapes on them, except the one we were using to compile the programs. So you know, the reality catches up with you. And then the, the performance things that they brought out, Ways to make it run 
or in real time. Yes, Bill. I'm sort of intrigued by the early part of your presentation uh, about by the, uh, the, the question of the arrival, of the emphasis you place on the arrival of the disk storage mechanism, because. Um, Prior to the arrival of disk storage, we had lots of sequential files, and uh, <coughs> with that kind of hardware technology available, we could possibly have invented the kind of database systems that you invented. So my, my question is really, to what extent were you triggered? Well, the, the, my understanding of, of the disk is that it was actually originally invented by IBM. Of the Rapid Death in yes. 1958. And the trouble was, IBM didn't think they could make money out of it. They didn't think they could make as much money out of it as they could make continuing to sell these, these tape units. So uh, they, they, they didn't, as far as I can make out, they didn't seem to push it. The first people to use it, I think, were, were General Electric. Whether it was the Ramac or whether it was something based on the Ramac, I don't know. But surely that was what the big enabler of the database. Oh, well, yeah, you couldn't have a network database in this no, sense. Really, no, yeah, yeah, I agree. No, you, 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 there were no, no drugs big enough, and the disk files were hardly big enough. So that was an enabling lack of legislation. So in fact, the slide is that we know we, we had a computer. Yeah. The 204 disk file was coming because it wasn't in the field yet when we started. But that triggered your thinking, really. Well, you know, we, you know the problem said we, we need. We need the disk file, yeah. or we need enormously big drums or something to solve the problem. Yeah. Because the, they weren't doing manufacturing control systems on tape systems, but they were like the one I said, you know, they're making a plan, then abandoning the ship because they couldn't maintain it. I wonder if uh, Bill's point another way around, that if yeah. you do this on IBM, you might even stop. <laughs> IBM, well, whether it's a sequential file, because that's what, that's what they have. And I suspect IBM were more reluctant. G. Well, the factory in GE, but on one of the dwarfs rather than so white. Yeah. It's probably an important issue. Well, I, I would say that IBM was driven by marketing, oh. and oh. GE was driven by manuf engineering and manufacturing. Yeah. You know, that, they, they, they answer the same question. Yeah, they, they, they were selling punch cards, they only did 17 computers in the world, you know, at one point, I thought. So that's long since I, I, I thank God you worked for GE, not IBM. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Next, next generation step, I'm sure the people in IBM told Ted Cott, design a database system which we can say is simpler than IMS, and which will use I lots I more presence. Well, the interesting thing about the Codasol group that started developing the standard, started out as a list processing task group, and it went nowhere, and no one was interested in list processing, except the artificial intelligence people. I, mean, the, I, I, I think that the name was changed very quickly. It was changed very quickly to something that was more relevant to what we thought the application was. Yes, sir. You, you mentioned the remarkably small number of people involved in the, the early days. Yes. And the, the immense achievement came out of it. In an earlier talk in this series, we were uh, regaled with a description of uh, airline uh, airline reservation. Uh, like the Sabre system. Uh, yeah, but, but British. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, uh, similarly, developed by an incredibly small number of people. I think because at the, at the start of any major project, the innovators don't realize the scale of what they may be getting into, mm -hmm. and so can take bro brave steps mm -hmm. that nowadays, when we ought to know so much more about how big systems get into trouble, we wouldn't dare take those first, first steps. Or if we did, we'd make sure we had an army of well-equipped people to, to well, get put it another way. Right. Um, they started to do something, and no one told them it wouldn't, it wouldn't work. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, so they work. I, I'm a, that was my thing about it. I'm amazed they entrusted me with, actually, I spent about three, four years of salary. Now, it wasn't a 
current day salary, but four years of salary, and a couple of people to do something on the faith that we could do something useful. But you know, the interesting thing, I said two people, Homer Card and I did all the programming for IDS and the problem controller. Totaled 4,000 instructions. Now why does it take four years to write 4,000 instructions? We wrote some of them several times, of course, before we got them right. But you know, somehow I, it takes a computer 10 times an instruction now to do what he's doing one instruction. And I don't understand why, but this high level language are so high that no one knows what they're doing. I was first appalled that looked at what PL1 as a programming language expanded into assembly language code because it, it was doing a for loop incorrectly. And I was trying to use IDMS on with PL1 as a pro programming language. And it was not iterating the way it should. So we finally said, let's expand this out and look at the actual assembly language code and see what's trying to do it. And actually it was the PL1 compiler was doing it incorrectly. But you know, there's a whole bad badge of code I could write in two, it's two uh, 225 instruction to do the same thing this whole thing did. We got to set up stack frame, do all this stuff, undo the stack frame. So it used to be easier, I think. Not that I was smarter, but it was easier in those days. And we didn't know what we couldn't do. You didn't know you couldn't do it, and you had very few people. Therefore, the complexity did not set in. The complexity that causes. Well, also, the fewer people you have, you don't have the complexity necessary to interface to, interface to build interfaces between people. Homer and I had a very clear interface. We called, what's the subject you call QBIC, Q block in core. And his job, I could call QBIC, I said, get that thing in the core and tell me where it is. And what on behind the scenes? Not my problem. And there was another one called QSWS, Q set right switch, which means I've changed this page. At some point when you're ready either to you need a new space for it, either write write it out. You can't just dump it. Yes. There's another question triggered by what you just said. When you were you and Homer were doing this programming, were you programming in what I would think of as machine language code? Assembly language, yes. Machine language. Excuse me. Machine language code and assembly language. Oh, oh no, this is assembly language. This was assembly. But the, but they're one to one so ratio. A symbolic assembler where you could give names to... Yes, you give names to things, yes. Okay, so it's assembly. It's assembly language. Okay. But there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between was assembly... Was it anything like SAP? What? Was it anything like IBM SAP? I don't know the, the answer. That was the original... Um, uh, the first symbolic assembly language, actually. It probably wasn't much different. I don't know, though. But it, but it must have been fairly close to machine language. Yeah, because it's, it's machine instructions are similar. Okay. You know, well, you got to add, subtract, did you have address Lord, registers? Pardon? Did you have index registers? I'm sorry, I'm missing your bill. Do you have index registers? Ah, three of them. Three? Three index registers. Wow. Just as many What's as What was the third one then? Only the two. Oh. Even the Manchester Mark one had. Jeff was back. I was just going to say on the subject of um, uh, employing lots of people, I always had a theory that if you employed a um, hundred programmers, they, each, they all have to justify their existence. So they all have to write a thousand lines of code. And this guarantees that you have a hundred thousand lines of code, or ten a thousand programmers, a million lines of code, and so on. So that's another reason for keeping the mythical man month story. <laughs> I, 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 I heard someone once said, I think it came from my friend, the IRCL or something, but they expected per programmer three lines of code a day. Debug. That was apparently the more than that. Seriously. But that's quite a few you don't believe that. Very well. Very well. Yes? May I volunteer an unreliable uh, story at uh, uh, IDMS in BT? You'll be aware that IDMS was the rights to IDMS were sold by a code name or the rights to use it sold to ICL in the nineteen seventies, quite cheaply. Yeah. Government they were in financial problems at that point. Um, when it came to implementing what we would now call a customer relationship system to BT, BT were undecided as to whether to buy ICL mainframes or IBM mainframes. So they decided they would actually implement their CRM system on 
both, which is how they came to choose IDMS. Because IDMS was the database management system which was common to both ICL and IBM mainframes. Now that may not be accurate, but I believe that to be accurate. <laughs> and, and I believe that's what you may hear tomorrow. And how, how recently have there been ICL machines or whoever owns ICL these days? The story I've just told you would be about, what, 20 years ago? About 20 years ago. Okay. okay. Any more questions? Any more stories? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much for being a attentive audience. Johnny, thank you very much. All the way. It's a privilege. Enormously important part. And again, just one or two people doing a job you couldn't possibly do. That's, that's always great to hear. Thank you very much. Thank you.